I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome. If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Welcome to episode 81 one of It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. On today's episode, we will highlight R.J. Lee's book, Grand Slam Murder. But first, we will have an interview with Anna Lee Huber. Anna Lee Huber is the Daphne Award-winning author of the national best-selling Lady Darby Mysteries, the Verity Kent Mysteries, and the Gothic Myths series, as well as the forthcoming anthology, The Deadly Hours. She is a summa cum laude graduate of Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee, where she majored in music and minored in psychology. She currently resides in Indiana with her family and is hard at work on her next novel. Visit her online at www.annaleehuber.com. We will be discussing the third in her Verity Kent series, Penny for Your Secrets, England 1919, and Anna Lee Huber's latest mystery. Former Secret Service agent Verity Kent is finding that life after wartime offers its own share of danger. The Great War may be over, but for many, there are still obstacles on the home front. Reconciling with her estranged husband, Verity sympathetic to her friend Ada's marital difficulties. Recently married to the Marquis of Rockham, is overwhelmed trying to navigate the ways of the aristocracy. And when Lord Rockham is discovered shot through the heart, with a bullet from Ada's revolver, Verity fears her friend has made a fatal blunder. Welcome, Anna. Thank you for having me. What drew you to write about the period right after World War One? I? I've always kind of been fascinated with that era. Really, my fascination began about a decade ago before it kind of got big. I think because we did so much time in school and other times studying like World War Two and the Civil War here in America, we didn't spend a lot of time on World War One. And once I started researching it, I realized really the start of the modern era. And it was such a cataclysm, unexpected thing. Everybody thought it was going to be over quick. It was over four years of slogging it out. It was really the beginning of modern military mass killing. And it was such a shock to us, especially the European culture, that it's just a fascinating time. I wanted to write a book about it, but I didn't know exactly how to approach it. And then about a couple of years ago, I had the idea. I was doing some research on something else, and I was actually looking at the British intelligence's website, the MI6 website, and I stumbled across this information about the women who served just a brief mention of them in World War One, and I thought, I didn't know there was any female Secret Service agents that worked for the British during World War One. and once I started researching, it was so fascinating, and that's kind of where the genesis of the theories came from and what really got me into that time period. In your second book in the series, Treacherous as the Night, La Dame Blanche takes center stage. How effective was the actual organization in ending the war when it did? It was very effective. There was a couple different spy networks earlier in the war that worked behind the scenes in the German-occupied areas of northeastern France and Belgium, but they were all caught out. They were all imprisoned. The German secret police really snuffed them out. So La Dame Blanc, they took up the reins really later in the war. Late 1916, 1917, the British were the allies, all the allies, but the British in particular were desperate for information behind the scenes when La Dame Blanche basically was some Belgian citizens that formed this and they approached the British because the British had money to fund them. They knew they had the infrastructure in place in Holland to carry the information out and make it useful. So they coordinated with them and they really set up this network
network. It was such a brilliantly set up network, which is evidence from the fact that hardly any of them were discovered. They actually, after World War One, they went dormant. But in World War Two, after the Germans came in again, they started up again. And that's what all of the resistance networks in France and other places were based on their model. But yeah, they were really effective, especially in getting information about German troop movements. That was critical in all the equipment movements so that the Allies knew where they were massing troops and supplies so that they could be prepared for an attack in that part of the line, the Western Front. One officer claimed that they had gathered up to 75% of the intelligence that the British received from that German occupied territory in the latter part of the war. So, I mean, they were very critical. This is Anne here. I read a fascinating book several years ago about La Dame Blanche, and I can't remember the name of it. When I saw this in your book, I went, oh, I remember that. That was really yes. fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I was really fortunate. There was a couple of research books I got to read, and there was one called Female Intelligence that was really fascinating. And then I actually found the man for military intelligence who was in charge of running La Dame Blanche, Captain Henry Landau, actually wrote a memoir like about a decade after the war. And that was absolutely fascinating. It has so many details that I would never have been able to find anywhere else. And I think it was called The Spy Net. That might have been the book I was looking at. You also write the Lady Darby series, which we adore. Is that series finished or are you going to continue writing it, I hope? I am continuing it. I actually just accepted an offer to write three more, which will take it up to book 11. Oh, um, great. Yeah, in 2023. So book eight comes out next April and it's called A Stroke of Malice. Stroke of Malice. Ah, perfect name for right for a malice domestic. I was just thinking about that. (laughs) (laughs) The women in all of your series are extremely tough and resilient. Is there a real someone that you base your characters on? There's not one particular person that I base them on. It's kind of more of a conglomeration of all the women throughout history who maybe we don't even know about. They were there because they brought us to this point in women's rights. I like to explore women who they don't necessarily stand out, but they were behind the scenes and they were really critical. And I mean, they may not even think of themselves as fighting for a woman's rights. To them, it's just common sense. And to us, it's now shocking and just common sense. But in that particular time period, not everybody felt that way. The murder in Penny for Your Secrets rang a bell for me. Was that based on a true crime? It wasn't at all a crime, but it is an anecdote that's pretty well known. It's actually about the second wife of the ninth Duke of Marlborough. His first wife was Consuelo Vanderbilt, which a lot of people know about. She was the American, didn't want to marry him, and her parents basically forced him. It was one of those traditional, she gets a title, he gets the money kind of things. They divorced, and he married his longtime mistress, Gladys Deacon. She actually, at a dinner party in the 20s, brought a gun to the table, and one of the guests asked her, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, I don't know. I might just shoot my husband. (laughs) I read that anecdote, and I thought, light bulb, what if he's killed? What happens then? So did she do it, or did someone else do it? I love those little anecdotes you read about in history books. They give us mystery writers lots of things to work with. (laughs) I knew I had seen that somewhere before. I must have read the same anecdote. (laughs) So you and I conversed a bit about this. It seems to me that Verity's husband is trying to push her into being a perfect little housewife and letting him do all the dirty investigative work. Is this how you see their relationship? Yeah, I thought that your take was interesting because I kind of don't see it that way. I think, especially in the second book, Treacherous is the Night, he's just come back from the dead and quote unquote, <laughs> not really dead, but and they're trying to make things work. Of course, her involvement in the British Secret Service was a secret she wasn't allowed to tell her husband. He had found out. He had all the war expected that she was at home just doing her little bit, taking care of the house. And, and they're wealthy, so it, it wouldn't be like it was a traditional housewife. Come to found out that's not how her war went at all. And for the war, she even expected to be that society wife, not really doing the standard things, going to tea, going to dinners, you know. But the war changed her a lot. And so when they come together again in Treacherous is the Night, they really have to figure it out, you know, figure out where their marriage is going to go from that point. Sidney has to accept his wife is different. I come to see at the end of the book, he accepts this and he realizes he actually kind of likes her better this way. And so then in the third book, when we get into that, I don't really see see him deterring her from investigating. He just wants to tag along. He's in for the adventure too. So he wants to be there with her. And I mean, of course, it's the male protective instinct, but I don't really see him holding her back from doing that investigating as 
more as like helping her and teaming up. And of course, when you read book three, you'll see at the end that they're really going to get into it. <laughs> right. It was just my take on it from the second book. He was just back from being dead. It just, in my mind, it felt like he was more accepting of what she had done in the end. And then in the third book, that was just my take on it, that he was kind of, let you stay home and I'll do all the dirty work. Well, well see, I didn't see it that way yeah. either. I, I stand corrected. It was just my No, take. you're not corrected. It's your... No, you're not incorrect. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> but I saw them as kind of a Nick and Nora Charles. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, the entire time I was reading it, I thought, oh, this is so the thin man. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in Verity, being Nora in this case, was the headliner of the story. Well, thank you. <laughs> sure. sure. Are you more of a Kira, a Verity, or an Ella? If I had to pick one, I'd probably say I might be more of an Ella from my first Gothic Myths book, Secrets in the Mist. I've realized as I've come to write it that parts of me end up in all of my characters, whether I intend it or not. That's probably more of an Ella. Huh. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Which series is more difficult to get right how do you research the different time periods? For research, I do a lot of reading. Obviously, for each time period, I do a big chunk of research about just the period in general, all the background details and clothing and food and all those language, all that kind of thing. And then for each book, I kind of get into different parts, specific time periods of history or specific events. So it's more specialized. I would say I find the Verdi Kent series to be maybe a little trickier just because it's more modern history. And so there's actually more research. There's more common knowledge of that era. So it's one of those things where you don't want to miss something and get it wrong. Whereas the Lady Darby series, because it's 1830s and sometimes the locations they go into it, in that sense, it's trickier to find the information. I figure if I'm doing my due diligence and I can't find it, then most other people can. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can fill in the blanks. <laughs> exactly. And then it becomes hated guessing, that kind of thing. So I guess they both have their trickiness, but I find the Verity Cat a little trickier just because I worry that I, even with all the research I do, I'm going to miss something and somebody's going to catch me out and I'm going to be like, oh, head smack. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up the language because while I was reading Penny for Your Secrets, of course, the rest of the series, the colloquialisms really jumped out at me while I was reading it. And I thought, oh, was that something that they phrased that way or what have you? Yeah, I did a lot of research on that. I've been language fascinating, so I try really hard to get it right for the era. For the late 1910s and the 1920s, it's such a fun era for language. They had all these phrases, lots of ways that they would say things that were fun. And I read a lot of diaries and letters and journals, and I would stumble across this turn of phrase and jot it down, you know? <laughs> I was like, I have to use that. I have to put that in one of my characters' mouths. You mentioned having another Lady Darby series book coming out. Do you have yes. any other new books or upcoming events you'd like our listeners to know about? The Penny for Your Secrets, the third period of book, it comes October 29th. And I have a couple events. Those are always listed on my website to make it easy for people. I'll be at the Chippewa Valley Book Festival in Wisconsin in October and also Books by the Banks in Cincinnati. And then obviously I mentioned the Lady Darby. That's out next year. And I actually also wrote, I co-wrote an anthology with authors Susanna Kearsley, C.S. Harris, and Christine Trent. It's called The Deadly Hours. And that will also be out next year. That'll be a lot of fun. Well, for our listeners, can you tell us your website? Oh, yes. It's AnnaLeeHuber.com. Perfect. Anna, we thank you so much for taking time to to talk with us today. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And will we see Thank you too. next year at Malice? Yes, you will. Oh, great. <laughs> right there. great. Right. right. Well, you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Take bye care. Bye. Bye. R.J. Lee follows in the mystery writing footsteps of his father, R. Keen Lee, who wrote fighter pilot and detective stories for Fiction House, publishers of Wings Magazine and other pulp fiction periodicals in the late 40s and 50s. Lee was born and grew up in the Mississippi River port of Natchez, but also spent 30 years living in the Crescent City of New Orleans. A graduate of the University of the South in Swanee, where he studied creative writing under Swanee Review editor Andrew Little, Lee now resides in Oxford, Mississippi. Grand Slam Murders is the first in the A Bridge to Death mystery series. After four bridge players are poisoned, new 
newspaper reporter Wendy Winchester sets out to catch a killer who's not playing with a full deck. When the four wealthy widows who make up the venerable Rosalie Bridge Club never get up from their card table, this quiet Mississippi town has its first quadruple homicide. Who puts cyanide in their sugar bowl? An aspiring member and kibitzer with the exclusive club, Wendy takes a personal interest in finding justice for the ladies. We try to connect with R.J. Robert, and we just could not get that connection going. He was kind enough to supply the answer.